Magical day, darlings! Welcome to Humanitarian Chronicles, where I highlight extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. I am conscious comedian, activist, and life coach, health coach, Abby Lodmer, and we are here today with the totally awesome yogi, bodybuilder, animal and human rights activist, spiritual seeker, and vegan, and all-around beautiful soul, Temi Tope. I am so grateful to be here with you, my soul brother, my kindred spirit. Thank you for joining me on this show. Absolutely. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the uh, generous intro. So. Thank you, Temi <laughs> Tope. You're so incredible, and our viewers will see why shortly. Just your smile is enough for now, but there's actually a concept in my ism that I was brought up in that dedicating a study session to a person brings inspiration to and elevates his soul. So in that spirit, I would like to dedicate this video to my health curious little homie, Ari Wolf, who has gone back and forth about becoming vegan and in hopes that what we, what we share here will inspire him and give him the impetus he needs to take the good green plunge. No expectations, just holy energy <laughs> channeled. So dedicated to you, Ari. I'm so proud of your path and I hope that what we share here today will inspire you even more. So, that being said, on with the show. I'll, I'll start it. No, to how did you become, how did you grow up and how did you come to your higher consciousness realizations as a strapping male here in Babylon, Temi Tepe? <laughs> how did um, you get a, around it? That's funny. Um, I actually grew up, um, grew up a child of, of African immigrants. Uh, they came over to America in the 80s and uh, grew up in Southern California. Orange County, and um, a lot of times I grew up. I grew up playing football, doing a lot of you know very stereotypical American things, um, and very much by what I thought was accident. I never planned at all becoming a, a, a yogi <laughs> or a vegan. Um, it very much happened uh, randomly um, over a series of just random events. And one day I found myself in a, uh, a yoga studio. Um, I found myself going through you know. I, I, actually, ever since growing up, I was always into, I think, spiritual things. It always kind of attracted me. That was, like, cool. Um, and I uh, was always open to it, I'd say. Although I wasn't particularly, like, super religious or, or good at it, if you will. Um, <laughs> but um, I ended up uh, doing yoga and doing meditation. And very, very small, right? Meditating, like, 30 seconds a day, a minute a day. Um, and over time, I think just sitting in the stillness of meditation, letting your mind and thoughts kind of settle down, um, and just looking, just being aware of what's going on more and more and studying stuff and then being aware of that, not just reacting to it. I think over time it became very obvious and it was over time. It wasn't just overnight. It became very obvious that, um, the vegan lifestyle was like, the solution to so many of uh, the problems on this earth. It just became like very obvious. It wasn't, it wasn't like a complicated thing. You didn't have to go to college for a semester to learn anything. It was just like, oh, simple yeah. stuff. Kids already know this. Like, oh wow, we're destroying the planet. We have slaughterhouses. Like, why? What slaughterhouse? What's? Why would we do that? Yes. <laughs> um, Amen. And so it just came. Yeah. Well. So yeah. Well, you know what? It it boggles my mind. I, I'm just so grateful that I when I found out about you through your biggest fan, my mother, who takes your yoga classes in L.A., I, when I heard about you uh, saying inspirational things while people are on their mats about specifically veganism, my mom's like, you've got to meet Temi Tope. I said, I've got to feature Temi Tope. But I, it just brings me back to this feeling I have that I'm just mind boggled at how few yoga instructors that I meet along with so many other spiritual and religious leaders, rabbis, priests, just shaman are not vegan, you know, and with yoga instructors specifically, since one main tenet of yoga is ahimsa, kindness to all beings, and they constantly recite the motto in every class I go to, may all beings everywhere be happy and free and promote mindfulness. And then I see them going out afterwards, after this hot, sweaty yoga class of mindfulness and ahimsa, to chow down on their carcass sandwich, totally unmindful of the harm that they're buying and biting into. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You're, you're totally right. Um, it's a uh, there is that contradiction, um, uh, but I, I was part of it too, right? Like, and that's how I try to look at it. Um, I started yoga before I became a vegan, and uh, I think part of it was that the practice of yoga increased my awareness. The practice of yoga increased my meditative abilities, and so with doing more yoga, my awareness grew, and eventually was like, oh wow, of course I shouldn't be eating animals, and oh, this doesn't. If I'm really being ahimsa, you know, practicing ahimsa, which is nonviolence, um, you know, and, being, and, and saying these things like all beings everywhere should be happy and free, how does this drive? But I had to do the yoga to get there. So I feel like in yoga, you'll find people on everywhere on, on the path, beginning, you know, any, anywhere on that evolving consciousness. I'm just by doing the yoga, they're on the way towards um, more compassion and more love. And yeah. for me, my, my, and I think I'm still on the way too. I'm still, there's probably other ways that can be more and more compassionate. But it's like it's inevitable that if you could live a life without being harmful to others, and you're practicing yoga, eventually you're, that's what you're going to do if you keep practicing the yoga at, at its core. And so um, I look at others who are doing that with the same compassion. I look upon my past self and be like, oh, he's getting there. Just he's or she that he's doing the, the work. He's going to the yoga. He's being more mindful. He's spending more time in awareness, and eventually it will happen. If you if you, if love is your is your guide to it, right? Because you know, I tell people even if you're like, oh, I'm you know, I'm I'm on this path of that. Even if you're not a yogi, but you're like, a lot of people will be like, I want I'll do uh, grass fed beef because they think it's different, even though it's not it's not really. A, or they'll be like, I'll do cage free uh, uh, eggs, etc. And I'm, to me, I'm like, that's not necessarily the goal. But if you already have even the slightest sliver, the slightest crack and opening in your heart to be compassionate because you're like, oh yeah, well, it's a little bit less humane slaughter and almost everyone's at least cool with that, yeah. right? But like, I have, a, I care my, to, to make, to make life a little bit better that I'm like, oh, you're, you're done for. You're going to end up being a vegan because love, there's this, this song by uh, Big Daddy Kane it's called No Half Stepping. Yes, <laughs> I know it well. <laughs> love, love is like that. There is no half stepping, not really. You might think like, oh yeah, I'm just being a little bit compassionate. Eventually, love will rip your heart entirely to open you all the way until you're like, well, if I'm really trying to be more loving and there's other ways to be even more and more loving, love's going to take all of you. It doesn't halfway. It does, doesn't compromise like that. It's, it's so it, it, eventually when you find out that like, oh, I can, at least for me, that I can have these tastes, I can go somewhere there like mock meats because I, I still want to be, and it could be, and I can help improve the life of these other beings or require less violence and less suffering from them. Oh, no brainer. Yes. Because it has, you're going to constantly you're going to constantly feel in conflict and un- you know until uh until you know those things line up right you're gonna yes. feel in conflict it's just you know and there's things i still probably feel in conflict in my life that i'm still working on and, and the yoga and the meditation um is, is helping to improve as i as i go along in this life and so yes, it, it, it's definitely it's definitely very common that you'll definitely find a lot of uh yogis or spiritual teachers or you know people who you know just like you'll find people in every religion who like maybe profess the tenets of that religion but they still might get mad at other people or do all these other things you know it's then even outside of the yoga right it's even in most of the religions it's like killing is not a good idea yeah yes <laughs> it like, is it is actually a sin and not allowed forget not I, a good idea i i love your compassionate stance it's truly inspiring you know um you're so amazing to empathize with people along their journey I, as a life coach, I sometimes say baby steps, baby results, big steps, big results. And I, I've judged myself by that same sword in my life, not, not being like, I love that you said you're just, you're being compassionate to your old self by being compassionate to the mirrors that you see in others who haven't yet accepted that veganism is the right and just and compassionate and ahimsa way. And yes, your, yours is a very forgiving, compassionate, loving viewpoint. And I can usually bring myself to come to that place these days as I remember when I too was living in my miseducated world of animal product consuming, thinking that was okay, though I have to bring up and I have to say, and I'd love your feedback about it, when people say to me, I respect your vegan diet, you need to respect mine, my meat eating one. A, they usually don't really respect my vegan diet because it's in their faces as an inconvenient truth and it's an affront to them. And But B, if they do respect it and they do, you know, then they want me to give them the same respect. And I'm just like, wait, what? No, I will not. 
I won't. I'm sorry. Of course you respect my vegan stance. My choice of diet and lifestyle isn't killing other beings, our own bodies, and our home planet, and our future for our children. Don't ask someone to respect a lifestyle that he or she believes to be unethical. Right. You know? I don't know where you stand on that one, but... Very interesting. I think, uh, for one, the best thing to do, I think, for uh, helping others along is being that example, right? Even if it being in their faces, uh, it would be, it's odd that it's offensive to them, right? It's, it's, why would it be offensive if I'm trying to just be more um, compassionate in my eating? But people get offended because sometimes they do feel confronted, right? It's an inner conflict of like, I'm conflicted. Like, who do you think you are not killing animals? <laughs> you know, like, you know, well, it, it's in a, weird, in a weird subconscious way, but, um, but I think that, that's the best way to do it is being that example. Because yes. people don't, it's hard to, it's hard to get someone to listen to you when you tell them to do something, people don't want to do what they're told, especially from someone they're like, who are you? You're not, you know, in particular, but living by example and that humility of just being, doing what you do, it, it I think does so much convincing for other people because they'll look at it. And so, um, and I, I agree though, I, I, with the idea that, um, the lifestyle of eating animals is, that's not, it's not just a lifestyle cho choice. It has very, very much so has effects on other beings. Um, it, it, it's directly contributing to, um, to uh, suffering and pain of animals. And I understand that it's hard sometimes just to be like to have that compassion stance, especially when it's in your face. I saw, I saw earthlings. I've probably seen earthlings a hundred times. Ooh. I mean, I've watched it, I've watched it over and over again. And it's hard to look at the suffering and then be like, Oh yeah, well, it's, it's difficult because you have these beings that are suffering that are also a part of you. Just like, these other people, other people who aren't necessarily vegan, like even people in my family aren't necessarily vegan, but I still love them because they're, they're a part of me. All these other human beings are a part of me, but so are these animals. And so it's even conflicting t to me because it's hard. Like I, all these animals are just, just as much a part of me as any other human being, right? And like they're a part of our circle of compassion. And, and, but I know that because the ways of the world uh, are so much aligned with kind of the violence and the murder, uh, of animals and it's been that way for so long I have to then sit back and look at what are the ways that it can be stopped it's yeah. it's whack it's crazy it's but mm, I know that I can't just go in and, and you know and stop every every you know CAFO concentrated animal feed operation or every place where they're slaughtering animals it's like it's so big of a problem how do you attack it and I found that um, I mean and I when I first went vegan you know the same way early religious converts have this sort of zealous you know zealous um <laughs> yes. Added, I was that way, like, yo, man, I never lost it. <laughs> like, oh, this is crazy. We have to stop. And I still feel I know, that. I know. I still feel that energy, but I now think about channeling it into into kind of more practical ways of reaching people. So I'm like, hmm, I know that people don't. When you hit them head on with it, they don't necessarily listen. But how about you just teach people to be more mindful? Hence, yes. teaching yoga. Because I know that it, I know that it's coming. It's truth. It's not me that has the special sauce. It's the it's the truth of the universe. So if you can be trained to sit, if you can be trained to think past your thoughts, if you will, um, and be aware of what's going on and be compassionate, you're going to end up being vegan. Oh, because man. because when you see what happens to these other beings, I I I, I know eventually eventually you will be like that's not right. Yes. And I want to stop it. Yes. You know, uh, it's it's so odd. As soon as you look, and most people don't want to look, right? Most people are afraid to look with their eyes at these videos of what's going on with the stuff that they put into their mouths, which is crazy. Because, like, at least with your eyes, you can shut it off. Right. It's just your eyes. Right. But, and, and you're like, I don't want to see it. But you're going to put what came out of that that you're not willing to look at, you're going to put it inside of your being? That's wow. crazy. Wow. That's actually, that's really, like, you should, that's a, that's a weird cognitive dif dissonance. That, that that's wild. You'll put it inside of you. You won't let it go inside your eyes or you'll put it inside your children who you claim to love. And so, and I'm not, I'm not saying that people don't love their children, but it's like, what about some awareness? And so the best way I think is, is, is teaching yoga and teaching awareness. Cause like, they'll see it. If you sit long enough, it'll come to you and you'll be like, I want to live a less, maybe a less harmful lifestyle to other beings. And then when you start realizing everything is energy and that, Oh, I'm putting energy into me. That's, from violence and suffering, hmm, what if I change that? And then just even being aware of how your life changes when you don't put in, you know, cr 
cruelty into your mouth and see how things around your life change. Maybe less cruelty or less negativity, you know, surround your life. Maybe. And it's worth giving a try and then being aware of those differences. But you got to have that awareness. You have to have the stillness in your mind, I believe, to come to it. And at this stage in my understanding, um, weirdly teaching yoga is the best way that I've found to bring people to more awareness and ultimately to veganism, right? I might drop, you know, hints and book recommendations and movie recommendations yes. here and there at the end of class, people to check out. Um, but I know they have to learn it. Everyone's got to really learn it on their own. They can't be told what to do, you know. Oh, man, honey. Wow. You brought up, oh, that was just so well said and so beautifully put. And yes, the I love uh, that you talked about the desensitization. Like how can we put something that is so wrong and so horrific and so tortured, injected, raped, dominated, mutilated, and murdered, how can we put that energy into our eyes and into our bodies? No, we won't put it into our eyes because we won't watch it. We don't want to know. We disconnect from the truth. But then we'll eat it. And I'd love to know your feelings about, yeah, and what we eat becomes us. You are what you eat. It's not just an adage. It's the truth. Science has proven it. This body, this flesh, this skin, these hooters, whatever, all everything was from something I ate. Yeah. Everything. Genetics has been disproven. It's epigenetics. But everything that that is me right now is from something that I thought or, or spoke or believed or ate. But... You know, eating builds us. So, yeah, it's like, it's crazy to me. Like, why would I want to become more angry, more depressed, more tortured inside? Um, why would I want to suppress my my majesty and, and, you know, all everything that animals go through? Why would I want to become that? Only You'd only want to become that if you weren't aware of the whole process. Right. So it's only a lack of awareness. It's only a, a darkness, a, a covering up, you know, that you know, lack of knowledge of certain things. And sometimes people don't want to know, right? Like, don't wake me. Don't tell me. Because yeah. <laughs> yes. you know what's underneath it. Um, yes. and, and people even admit to that. And so, but sometimes people aren't ready for the whole truth because they can't deal with it. Um, and so, and there was a time I was, I remember I was like, I don't want to watch that stuff. But then when I became like on my way to it, I was like, I want to watch, I've seen, I cannot think of a piece of footage um, I mean, I've seen a lot of it. I, I sought it out. There was a time period where I looked for every, like, I did not look away from a single thing. I sought out every instance of animal cruelty to really make myself face it and confront it. And especially since the ag gag laws that have came out uh, relatively recently, and there's not as much footage coming out because it's been billed as terrorism, which is which is crazy. Um, you know, even looking at the whole the whole ag agriculture industry. Yeah, uh, it, it let's let's cool. focus on that. It's billed as terrorism. It's wild. It's These wild. videos are in the same category as terrorism. So you can't film. There's laws against filming at a slaughterhouse. There's laws against filming at a factory farm. You That's cannot terrible. film footage. Talk about censorship at a factory farm or a slaughterhouse. It's illegal. Where they're making your food. Where they're making, where the they're food making your food. Making. You cannot see it. It's in the same category as terrorism, and, and you're eating that. I mean, the, the ironies are, are kind of build up on top of the, on top of themselves when you analyze the situation. For one, some of the most terror-filled and horrific acts are happening in there. And to film and expose that is an act of terrorism. That's that's like literally turning the whole situation on its head, right? People who want liberation and freedom and are driven by compassion to, to, to whistleblow on what's going on. I mean, even if you were for eating meat, even if you weren't vegan, you should be totally against that because these people can expose at least what's happening to the food you're putting in your body. Like what if people were, you know, which they are, you know, if you talk about spiking the punch metaphorically, there's a, a, uh, ridiculous amount of antibiotics that are being that's being pumped into these animals because the living conditions are so horrific that you couldn't you couldn't even survive a being could not survive in those conditions with where they're living when they're within their own waste and have such cramped living quarters you would die yep. unless you have these drugs yep. and then you have to think about how are these if if these drugs are being injected in these animals how's it affecting you because again you're eating that as well you're eating the antibiotic i mean i think the i'm i know the number one the number one purchaser of pharmaceuticals is the agriculture industry. Most, That's right. most That's of right. the most of the pharmaceutical produced medicines being uh, most of the medicines being produced 
don't go to humans. They go to animals. That's right. And we, we kill so many of them a year, and they need it to survive. And right. They... And the GMO crops, which are pure chemical poison that explode your guts. Everyone has IBS because you're eating chemical-laden GMO flesh. GMOs, hormones, to make them keep producing and getting bigger and fatter quicker. Antibiotics because you can't put hormones and GMOs into a sentient being and make them live in cramped spaces pecking each other's eyes out, oh, until they're de-beaked with no anesthesia. Um, you can't make these animals healthy. There's no way to grow, grow, harvest. I love that they treat animals like commodities, like vegetables. Are we going to harvest beef? I'm going to harvest pig. You can't harvest these animals well. And then you are what you eat. You're, you're eating tumors and sickness, antibiotics, hormones, GMOs, pesticides, poison, and, and like we talked about at first, the bad karma, which affects us spiritually, mentally. There's so much psychosis, depression, ADHD, uh, mental illness, um, bipolar. Yeah, there's multiple levels to it. Like you said, for one, eating the tumors and the cancers, and, and we see that the, the rampant rise of cancer in our society over, over time. But you wouldn't even know that unless you could see what was going on, which is why I think everybody, even non-vegans, everyone should be able to get on board against ag gag laws. Um, that, that, that make it illegal to film those things. So if you don't see the cancerous tumors on the animals that come from, again, you're feeding them growth hormones. So why, why are we surprised that they're getting extra growth, uncontrollable growth? And then why are we surprised when it's happening to us as humans when we're eating that? Right. But you don't know that if you can't see it. And so everyone should be against the ag gag laws. And then on a, on a, I think the strongest point for veganism and the most, the one that makes it stick to me the most on the, just the spiritual energetic level of like, Man, it, it's not easy to break habits. I get it. It takes time. But, man, when you understand, when you hear, even forgetting the, the disease and those, the, the physical stuff, when you hear the scream of a mother cow asking for her, her child or the, the screams of terror of these adolescent animals, right? Most of them aren't, aren't allowed to grow to, to adulthood before they're, they're slaughtered for, their, uh, for food or other purposes. Um, before they're raped. Something in, before they're raped. Well, yeah, that, that as well. They're oh, yeah, not, that as they're well. not even adults. Case. Usually adult animals choose a mate and breed and settle down. Ducklings follow their mom all around and their dads. Uh, you know, cows stay in their families, in their herds. Pigs are very familial, very family-oriented. All uh, goats, lambs, very into family and community. And they don't breed until after adolescence. We are, we are literally raping children. And, yes. and guess what's happening all over the world because we become what we endorse and we become what we eat. Sex slavery, sex trafficking, raping of children, child brides are rampant. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, you're, no it's totally right. And I, I appreciate the, uh, the input. And I think that's when that comes from, again, being aware, like, oh, wait, the, you know, the mistreatment of these animals and the mistreatment, it spills over into how we treat one another. And, you know, it and it's obvious even in our language, right? Like, there's so many instances of, uh, of degrading other humans where we talk to them like they're animals. We call them animal names, right? Whether you're talking about the Hootsies and the Tutus, calling cockroaches, um, you know, oh, the Hoot Hutus and the Tutsis, I'm sorry. Yeah, they were the Rwanda. Rwanda genocide. That's or right. the re reference to Jews as rats in, 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 in the Holocaust or... Or the re reference to African Americans as, as coons in, in the South when people would go out to murder. I mean... But, and the thing is, if we could remove the space for hate, even from animals, we would take away the place for our hate to hide, right? Because it's like, instead of people being mad, like, oh, I can't believe you referred to me as an animal. It should be like, what's wrong with animals? Thank like, you. That's beautiful. Even if you, were, even if you were a cockroach or a rat or a raccoon, we don't kill those things. We don't eat those. Animals are not less than us. That's right. You know, That's in right. terms of value. So it doesn't. You literally have no excuse. You have no excusive language to permit that. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and 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 it's it's quite fascinating. But um, the words create the world. Are yeah. Words, call me yeah, a zebra. Crap. I don't care. This is the closest that I'll ever get to having a dead animal on me. Animal print, baby. Right. It's not for Yeah. It's not actual. Animal. <laughs> <laughs> Which is controversial in the vegan world, I know. But in yeah. honor of your African up uh, um roots. <laughs> Temi Tope, I felt, you know, I felt called, I felt a called, a call. I don't even know if there are zebras in West Africa. 
It might sound uh, uh, completely I'm not ignorant. sure either, but I, I think as I think there's a beautiful and fantastic connection between African spirituality and nature, uh, with animals, um, you know, the oceans, the waters, the sky, the, the, the heavens, and I love that about uh, about a lot of the indigenous African uh, spiritual traditions and that kind of quote unquote direct you know relationship with the creator, right? Like uh, I think it's part of our our shared human ancestry as well, right? That's the first way that human beings you know, in Africa, according to science, connected to, to the creator and the most high was through nature. And I think if we all get back to those, those, those roots, right. Uh, you know, I, I like, I was saying that, you know, human centricity is Afrocentricity and human centricity are the same thing. It's not some like weird outlying thing to be like Afrocentric. It's human centric, yes. you know, and if we can get back to these like core spiritual core values of all religions, all religions come out of, I think, um, we'll be closer to more compassion for more beings and, closer to veganism, you know, um, and I think, uh, what's her name? There's this great vegan, her name's, uh, something, her last name's Goudreau, I think, something Patrick Goudreau. Um, she mm-hmm. has a saying where it's like, the goal isn't necessarily to become the most vegan or be the most vegan person. It's to be the most as compassionate as possible and have such a wide compassionate circle. It just so happens that in today's day and age, veganism is a fantastic way to become more compassionate because it takes into account the the be the, the the life of other beings and the feelings and emotions and the experience of other beings beyond you right like you, you, we had at first there was a time in human history where it was like very you know just me myself right I just care about myself and my own passion then okay my family and then okay my race or my my people my group my tribe and then it was like oh you know just recently right there was like oh all people not just people of this certain color blah 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 like <laughs> we're just getting out of that. Right. But can't we see the pattern? Like, can't we see the outgrowth? I mean, then next, what's what's next? When it's like, oh, all people should be treated the same. Like, that's not controversial anymore to say all people should be treat, treated the same regardless of what race, religion, culture, sex. And we say that all the time, right? right. right. Sexual orientation, all that. Then why wouldn't we keep expanding that? Why would we ever stop our expansion of love? Let's keep expanding. So it should be animals too, of course, right? Who's okay. against that? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and the same not necessarily the same people, but the same mindset that's against that, the same mindset that was against expanding rights to all human beings. We had civil rights in the United States where it was like, why, why not? Why, why what? Not? Yeah, okay. Some people were against it. And it's like, what is wrong with you? And, and right now we look back and it's like, oh, clearly they were on the wrong side of history. But I think the same thing's happening today. We have a, another opportunity to expand the circle of compassion and to live like so. And obviously it should be animals. Obviously no being deserves to be, that, to me at least, I think it's just if you if you follow the the thread of love to its center, then anytime you encounter a being that's being that's suffering or that's hurting, you're gonna do what you can to undo that suffering or hurting because if you see that person as a part of you because that's the truth of the matter. Yep. And um, veganism is is a way and a philosophy to to help do that. And there are there are great yogis who do practice and espouse vegan. Sri Dharma Mitra from the, uh, he's still alive even, from the Dharma Mitra uh, Center in New York. Yep. He's a yep. fantastic, and I think, I think, I think he more recently became vegan, because he comes from, I think, the, the Indian tradition, the Hindu tradition, where he was raised vegetarian. Yeah. And there's even, like, I think, um, I don't know which, um, it might have been one of Gandhi's descendants, maybe not, I think it was, a doctor, it might be Sonia Gandhi, who talks about, like, in India, the movement to, like, get people to go vegan and get off the milk and et cetera, um, not so much because milk in itself is bad or eggs in itself is bad, but because of the way that it's being quote unquote harvested, the way in which we're doing it is so devoid of compassion, is so devoid of love that we should not do it. You know what I mean? Like, well, I live without it. We I have with- to, I 100% agree with you. And I have to add, I do think milk in and of itself is bad from another mammal, from my studies, from my 20 years of nutritional health in the human body studies any even studies with cats when you that Weston Price did when you give cats cow milk they they're deformed three generations later they're dead stillborn or deformed what do you think is happening to us even crooked teeth are a deformation crooked teeth are a deformity our skulls are supposed to grow down straight with we don't need to get our wisdom teeth pulled the only reason we need our wisdom teeth pulled is because our mouths are so deformed that they don't even have room to grow in, we have to, there's cr- overcrowding because it's a deformity. And why are so many women, uh, you know, not able to birth or breed children? There's so many stillbirths nowadays. There's so much people can't get pregnant, you know? I, 
not, I'm not positive on the numbers of all, all those things, but I do think that there's been so many instances, you know, there's times and places where, you know, whether it's between different mothers, even amongst humans themselves at first, that's the most obvious where one mother maybe doesn't have enough milk for her children because she's malnourished or whatnot. And another mother can take care. And though there's a different profile in the same species, right? You know, just from genetics, you know, someone coming from like a northern part of the of the world versus the southern, you have different things that happen that make you phenotypically different. There might be different uh, outputs. Um, and I'm sure there might have been a time in certain places in history where humans couldn't produce enough milk or whatever, and so they took it from cows. You know, right? Um, Agreed. In an emergency, go for it. And there, I, there's, there's, yeah, right. Think about the Ice Age, right, in parts in probably north, north, uh, north, in the north, northern, north hemisphere, right, where things got really uh, cold, right, and there was right. ice. The Ice Age, maybe. I mean, there was no, you know, like when we started out in Africa, it was more than likely there were plants and trees where food was literally growing out of the ground and dropping from the sky. That's right. <laughs> right, dropping Mama from, from heaven, off. baby. That's why right. would I? Why would, right, why would I go try to hunt an animal down in blood and all this? But if you're, it's an Ice Age, which may happen for whatever reason. And there's no food. Oh man! Then people had to kill animals, perhaps, and use their their, their skin for furs and all this. And like, it's a sad time. That sucks. But it's a sad time. Yeah, it choice. sucks. It's not ideal. But it's not, not ideal. Gonna, it's, yeah. And people talk about with you know whether it's paleo, etc. Like getting back to our roots, which I, I have issues with because I'm like our roots aren't in caveman days, right? Our roots are in, on the plains, probably. Like roots are more than likely in Africa as human beings. Like, yeah. But, but we have this idea of which is you know obviously mixed in somewhat with a you know. Uh, are the very um, off kind of origins of human beings, right? Whenever you see pictures of cavemen, they're usually pictured as light-skinned people, right? As though, like, the earliest humans were light-skinned, which, according to scientific data, was probably not true. No, we're was, all African. Well, we are all African, so all you haters out there who don't like the darker-skinned people of this earth, hey, guess what? You are that. Hey, guess what? You, you went away from the sun into a different hemisphere, and your skin lightened. Right, yeah, to get I, more I melatonin up in it. So, hey, we're all so, African. We're all herbivores. Right, and so by that token, it's like, um, but because we have that idea that, yeah, it must have been like these kind of European cavemen as early humans, and so it's things like the paleo diet catch on, and it's like, wait, that's not our, no. that's not human history. That might have been a time period where some humans in certain climates had to go through that, but even if all that was the case, we know that today and now, we don't live in an era where, we have to. In fact, most people wouldn't even. Although some, there's a whole like kill what you eat movement. That's a different story. But most people wouldn't and don't go out and kill their animals. Nor do they have to. Right. And so it's like, why do we continue this practice of bloodshed and murder? And why do we not think that it affects directly what's going on in the world? Like, yes, honey. Oh, there, 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 there will never be. I don't believe that we can ever have a planet in peace as long as we allow slaughterhouses. As long as we allow. And regularly, page, you know, patronize places where they kill innocent beings for no reason or for food for any reason. They're innocent beings because I like it. Why? Because I like the taste of meat. Oh well, I like my planet, and I like feeling great, and I like animals being able to live happy and free. So, please right. adjust long, your taste buds. A lot of those things uh, to happen will never be at peace on this earth. Right? It's not any just one person. It's our society, and so. Um, I, I just hope for more, and I know it's going to take time, right? I'm not expecting, like, I, I get the state of emergency, too, right? This is crazy. It is crazy. It's crazy. But it's like, all right, so how do, you, how, do you, how do you move things along? It's not an overnight thing. It's a piece by piece, each person, each one to each one, right? Someone, I, someone might see this, right? Like, I watched so many YouTube videos and read so many Wikipedia articles and did research in so many different ways on my journey and understanding and, um, you know, along with just mindfulness and meditation. Yes, and, it's obvious. and so people are on the people, you know, might have different paths, it might, you know, whatever. But I think everybody's consciousness is evolving towards more compassion, and somewhere along that road of more compassion, the blood spilling of innocent beings, mostly children, right? They're mostly children, and animals, yes. and they're adults. And for you, that's going to stop. That's going to stop. It's just not compatible. And I think everyone knows that, you know, somewhere in their consciousness. But it, it just takes a while to to, to flower and um, and you know and I think it's you know there's still things on flower like I said earlier I'm not that I've reached the pinnacle of anything I I'm still on flowering in other ways you know um, well if we stop growing I, we die so what are we doing here we better keep growing we better keep growing there's always more to learn and stuff like that but I don't I do not believe at this point in my understanding that 
there's ever I don't I don't believe that I'll learn something that makes it okay to kill innocent beings ever. It doesn't just it doesn't drive at all. That's makes right. People, you yeah. oh honey, you are just you've thought this through and felt this through so deeply as I have. And I'm trying to be more zen like you and be accepting of people's paths, and I am. And and I just can't get over like the tenets of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, and just thinking, wait a second, the most peaceful, happiest, healthiest cultures that have ever walked upon this earth have been vegan. The Hindu people, the Tibetans, um, the Buddhists, the, the, the vegans in India, it's the herding cultures, which is the Judeo-Christian and Islamic cultures that throughout history have been the most warring, the most, you know, raping, subjugating, torturing, dominating, abusive of women, children, each other. And it, you as an African, me as a Jew, I'm, I'm just like, both of our histories have slavery in it. Both of our histories have subjugation of, of people of more vulnerable peoples. You have been, your people, just anybody with darker skin than the white man has been, you know, captured, tortured, shackled, enslaved. Jews have that history in Egypt. The Holocaust most recently, you know, I mean, I just saw picketing at a, an Israeli dance show I was at yesterday. But, you know, I mean, it still goes on. I'm, you experience it too, I'm sure. You know, there's prejudice every day in every way because of our skin, because of our background. But it's just kind of mind blowing to me when I get together with people of uh, you know my ism or mm. with my darker skinned friends, and I'm just like, we've been enslaved. That's like part of the drum we beat of our culture. Why why can't we wrap our minds around the fact that for these animals, it's an eternal treblinka? Mm -hmm. I love that book. Yeah, like, I, I just, especially for, for me and for you and for people, our people, our, we're, all of our people are our, our, our people, and I feel that. I understand, I, I get what you're saying, and I think there's, there's so many levels to that, um, and I'll, I'm going to read off a list of fantastic books, so to go into that please, in a please. fantastic and careful and beautiful, um, mindful way on, on looking at those those connections, and also want to be mindful and respectful of uh, definitely those that... Um, it, you know, because so, so just to give us a little background too, um, my parents came to this country in the 80s and because of and gratefully so of the Africans that were brought here against their will um, hundreds of years earlier, my parents were able to live in this country unmolested generally, comparatively, right? right. Um, and have kids, right? No one could break my family up and sell my mother and my father. And because of that, I have such a a uh, debt of gratitude and, and, and thanks to the African American tradition of people here who went through that. You know, even though my ancestors didn't have to go through that in America, I totally understand and pay caveat and respect to those that bled, and died, and were persecuted so that we could come here safely now as Africans in this kind of new, new, newer, uh, newer age. And that's not lost on me. Um, and so I have a lot of respect for it, for the, the the people that came before me. And I think every human being in America should because it's like that laid the foundation for like, oh, we have to treat everyone equally. So when other, you know, other people come in, they, they are all, everyone's benefiting from that. Not just me as kind of a, a quote unquote neo-African American or whatever. Um, um, right. But, and, and, but to that point, I think it's, I think then people who do have that history of persecution in this country have an even more uh, fantastic opportunity, I would say, to beat that drum of veganism because it's like, you know, I take it uh, for them, if I can speak for them at all, like I take it as an offense that you use the same systems and the same, some of the same physical instruments yes. to subjugate other beings that you used to do to me. Like, you know, like uh, I went to the Museum of Tolerance. I remember when I was younger in school, which talked about like the, uh, the Jewish Holocaust and we saw pictures and, and all these other things. And it's like one of the main mantras was, you know, never again. We'll never let this happen again. They were transported in cattle cars, no less. It's Right, and they and you're going to use the same cars and the same systems to do the same thing to someone else, and I'm supposed to be okay with it because it's someone else. That yeah. isn't someone else. That's another part of me. These animals are not something else. And it's and energetic. That, that, oh, say it again. It's just it's it's energetic too, regardless of whether it's a human or an animal. It just the energy the behind it. And I, and I feel like we have more of a leg to stand on 
um, when you come from an oppressed people, which is why I think Gary Yarovsky's message has been so powerful and well accepted in Israel, you know. Um, and I also think it does help to, it helps when those arguments come from within those groups of people, right? Like, uh, you know, I, I'm, if, if I'm not Jewish, you know, African and Jewish isn't mutually exclusive, right? There's African Jews, et cetera. Of course, but yeah. If I is not, not being explicitly Jewish, went to Israel and said the things Jay Garyowski said, would be not listened to as well, right? Not well received, as, it, as I understand, right? Just like any family, any group, like, you know, there's nicknames sometimes we have for like our loved ones, right? You might call it, you know, you might call your wife booby head, you know, but like if someone else calls you that, it's like, hey, you, look, you're not in it like that. <laughs> And by, by that same token, when you go into like African or African American communities, I think you know when it comes from within the community, from people who see that it's much more powerful than outside, which is which is why I think sometimes you have the conflict within um, speaking communities, whether it's communities of color, et cetera, or not, where it's like, hey, people get offended if you speak about certain things in certain ways. It's got to come from within those groups, I think, and I, I think that's a beautiful thing. Or amongst people who who understand that and don't take the offense, and they can be like, okay, you. It's a beautiful thing, right? It's like, all right, you go back to your people and say, you can say this, and I'll go back to my people and say this, because we're trying to get them to the same place, and we know that when you take advantage of the fact that we are the divine manifested in these certain groups, manifested as a member of this group, and so I have a, I have a better chance and a better opportunity to go in and speak about something to certain people. As you do, you know, like for example, there's the whole, you know, feminism movement, right? I can't as easily go to a bunch of women and be like, it's the rape is the same thing as this and that. That's going to be what more well received by a group of women from a woman who's talking about it. There's a beautiful book written by um, I don't know her name, but it's called The Sexual Politics of Meat. Wow! Uh, wow. The Sexual Politics of Meat. Wow! It's like a vegetarian critical theory, vegetarian feminist critical theory book. Like that's amazing. Wow. That's fantastic, right? I would love to see things like that, you know, and I totally support things like that. But I don't think I'm necessarily the best best voice piece oh, if you I'm will sorry. wow um, yeah i understand of- well i've talked all about that especially in recent weeks when everyone's been wearing pink beanies and picketing all over the streets and i'm thinking well i've said this to my friends like wait so we want reproductive rights and we're scared that the new establishment in american government is going to take away our reproductive rights but we are what we eat every single day at the end of our fork we're eating a chicken pig cow goat lamb whose reproductive rights have been taken away, Uh, that's to say it mildly, who have been raped and dominated and subjugated and tortured and murdered for our taste buds. Not for our health because meat is not healthy. Dairy is not healthy. It is not a health food. It is killing us. Okay, we are herbivores. You can study up on that. Dr. Milton Mills, totally inspirational, talks all about how we're herbivores. Many other subjects, uh, people, and topics out there. And, and when I and when I did when I talked about um, milk itself or dairy itself not being bad, I mean in the in the cases it's used, it's meant for right, like Emergency. when when mammals are children, when mammals are infants, right from their own mother to grow faster, right? But right. Most animals, all except human beings, as far as I know, after you reach past a certain age, you wean yourself off that milk because you don't need to grow as fast. You don't need those nutrients, in which effect yes. it can become harmful. And so, um, we don't need liquid lunch anymore. Right. As your teeth come in, et cetera, <laughs> and you can, you can digest food. And so, um, it's definitely times where dairy is good for you and times where it's un- totally unnecessary and definitely no question uh, now the way it's produced, you know, with drugs and in, in coming from the energetic udders, the, ut- the udders of energetically crying child mothers that are lamenting the loss of their children. Yes. That is just bad sauce all around. That's not Heck a good yeah. look at all. Um, there might have been a time where it was more harmonious and it made sense, maybe. Um, at this stage in my life, I don't dig dairy at all in general. It's like I'd rather have plant milk, if anything. Yes. Um, but, um, but yeah, we're no longer, we're past any kind of harmonious harmonious exchange of milk from from mothers of cows and, and humans. It's, it doesn't, it's so rare, right, when it happens. It's like, oh, look at that picture. You know, and in those cases, I'm not like, you know, I don't fault people for, for, for whatever they're doing that, you know, if you're in an Amazonian village and like, that's part of your food supply, like we have these kind of, I don't, I'm not, that's not my, my battle yeah. <laughs> right now. It's a, it's this massive, um, unconnected, unaware consumption of dairy that tramples all over the divine feminine manifested as, as, as these mothers, they are mothers, right? These cows, et cetera. And, um, and, and I think that's, you know, if I can speak from a, from a, from a masculine male point of view, 
that is the biggest affront to I, the divine feminine is the way we take mil- milk and eggs, right? There's the whole meat thing, right? With breeding and rape, that's crazy. But this is literally the magic of reproduction, the magic of reproducing and or housing the cells and the body to reproduce the body for another soul to enter this planet, this world, this universe that lies within the feminine, that magical thing that chickens, women, uh, cows, you know, they all share and all these, all the female species, acro- females across species share. What a divine and powerful and magical thing that we should like honor and be in awe of and, and love and, and cherish and protect. And, and the fact that it's used and so degraded for commodity, for eggs and milk, uh, that to me is just like, well, this is like a huge, I hope a huge place for advancement of feminism is looking at milk and eggs, milk and eggs, because that's the, that's the reproductive, that's the direct way it happens. It's like babies and babies and mothers and children, mothers and children, mothers and children that's right. all day long. So you look at the chicks that are being ground up on the way to, you know, when they're males, right, when they're born, these are babies we're dealing with or the calves. Right, right. Like again, it has to do with gender. So it's gender. It's huge on gender studies, right? Because at birth, if you are a baby cow or a baby chicken, you are slaughtered for death or a life of slavery. That's crazy, and it's and it begins immediately, right? The boys, all the all the men, males are killed. I mean, I mean, this is just so deep to me, man. If you, oh my god, if it's, it's back a story. To you look at a lot of Amer- American slavery, like what they did to males, like That's this, right. like oh, useless. We're gonna catch you. We're gonna kill you. So put you in the reeds. Like this is this is wild. And then the women um, to to subjugate them to that and to kind of breed that is crazy town. And so I think it's 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 probably the number one one of the number one affronts to the female energy manifested as a human or not. The female energy in our society is eggs and milk, and yes. it, it it makes total sense that all of a sudden you know if we have such a society where we regularly control the reproductive systems of animals and what they produce and we think we own it. And I think overly patriarchal society, then of course it's going to end up in our legislation. And we're going to think that we should control what women's do with it, what women do with their bodies and whether they should have birth control or not. Cause we do it to other beings. That's right. So, and of yeah. course we're going to have rampant infertility and stillbirths and deformations and mental so, problems so I, with our offspring because they, Mm-hmm. Naturally, what... we do it. Naturally, naturally, I believe that. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that chickens, just like just like humans, they have twelve cycles a year. Generally, naturally, yes. twenty-four twelve, like 12 eggs, 12, <laughs> just... cycle, twelve eggs a year. Yeah, tw- right. twenty Once a month, just like a menstrual cycle of a human woman. That's but right. We've changed to we've totally cranked with that system. And you think that you can crank with the system? You can fiddle with the you know the workings of a, of the reproductive system of an animal, and then eat what comes out of that system. And think that our systems won't be tweaked. Franken food, it, you're becoming the Franken food, honey, for the mm-hmm. for the yeah. medical big pharma. But that's another conversation. But Coming yeah, in. just to break it down, what Temi Tope and I are talking about: a chicken hatches, well, releases an egg one, uh, twelve times a year, sometimes twenty times a year, depending. It is just it has been it's equivalent to a female human's childbirth. That's how Which painful. Also points out- which also points out how connected we are to them, right? Like the yes. human women, and like they were connected. We're all they're all on the same. Just like you know, women who live together. You know, it's been said that after time, the cycles will link up. We're all connected. Like all the cycle connected. that's going inside of you as a woman is going on these other female creatures. It's a similar thing. We're you're you're all affected by a similar outer energy that's bigger than us. And, and so I think it's so cool. It's like it should be a point of like connection with these animals. They're like, oh, if you do the same thing, they get it the same way we get it. Wow. That's right. Celebrate it. Don't, you know, dominate it. But yeah, these, these chickens are, these hens are hatching eggs. We, and it's just like female human childbirth. Okay. It's that taxing, that painful, that emotional. Okay. For chickens to lay an egg. We are making them lay uh, up to 300 eggs a year. That's what we're doing. And then, of course, they die years before their their lifespan should be over because we are abusing. Condition, right? And not not just like die, like oh, die, like their oh. their calcium has been depleted because we overwork their their reproductive systems. They are sometimes you know featherless. The stress they have, like never being able to expand their wings in many cases, and it, it's they are not even. I mean, the life they live, it's almost some might even say that their their uh, brothers were luckier to have been killed at birth. 
than to live through that life of suffering. And it's a, uh, it's tragic. It's tragic. De-beaked with no anesthesia, not to mention, which is just like a human root canal. They actually have said it's just like getting all of your teeth pulled at once or root canals on all of your teeth at once. That's what de-beaking with no anesthesia does to these chickens. Okay. So that's all, that's like, that's the, like, that's just the beginning of what they the go beginning. through. De and that's the beginning. Like you look at the baby cat, the baby, uh, pigs that are castrated and, and tail docked, uh, and their teeth are cut and the screams that they go through, um, it, to eat pig products crazy crazy, crazy Honey, products. we're but on we're on the same wavelength i'm so happy to hear someone speaking logic it's that's what it is it's like it's logic to me i mean yes it did i did have my own journey and i was a corpse a corpse muncher and i did treat my body as a morgue for a while in my life instead of a yeah. temple though I, I i now from the perspective i'm at i'm just like Thank you for being there because it's so refreshing and it actually makes my feathers grow back <laughs> and makes me less stressed to actually talk to somebody who understands these principles of life. And yeah, the, the cows, oh God, the pigs, it's tragic. The cows, they, they are fist up the um, female yeah. genitalia, um, fist up there to inseminate them. They do not get to make love. They don't get to choose a partner, which they do in nature. They have partners. They make love. They play. They jump and scamper and hop in the field. They are put in little crates their whole lives, veal and other cows. They are inseminated by a human fist on a rape rack. It's called a rape rack. These farmers admit that it's rape, and they impregnate them so many times until they die, basically impregnate them forcibly until they're, they stop producing milk because their bodies are so overtaxed. And then their babies are stolen away to be caged and put in a traumatic little cage, not able to move a limb to be veal a few months later, live in horror. And these mother cows are screaming and cr crying. And then science has shown, both in cows and humans, that when a mother is going through trauma, it comes out in her milk. So all the dairy products and milk we're drinking are full of fight or flight hormones and grief hormones. Grief. Cortisol. Grief. The, energy, the energy alone is is grief. We're literally drinking like sad cows. We are. Like it's really like it's really mind blowing. But I wish sometimes everyone we could see energy. You know, you could feel it. Like you could see the energetic i wish there was like the way there's nutrition facts on the back of uh, things i wish there was like a little like karmic coefficient energy meter of like you know what's the energy of this food yes. and i think people would we, we would um people would, would change up right all those cows you mentioned right like the first they die in their adolescent they're they're i think five years is the absolute maximum i've ever Max. heard of a milking cow surviving yeah. and upon their death they are killed and we eat the food so not even do we drink their milk we eat the meat of this suffering mother who's probably went through birth maybe five times, right? You know, as, as soon as she can to until she doesn't produce milk fast enough and we eat them and they're turning to meat. They're not thrown away. Like dairy cows are used for meat when they're done, when they can't give birth. So it's like adding insult to injury. You've given us your life force. You've given us the product of your womb. We've taken it. And now we will take you like, it's really like, and, and, and I think it's only because of unawareness. I don't, I think when, when you, when you sit and confront it, every human being has that capacity, I believe, to be like, oh, wow, that's crazy. That's super whack. And, of course, I want to change, which is why and how eventually I think most people become vegan. You know, let's stick with it, right? It's a compassion thing. If you do it for diet, I don't. I think you'll be done in a couple, you know, I, I, it's not as, to me, it's not as, it's not as connective of a hook. It's not as adhesive, if you will, yes. <laughs> to be there for anything other than compassion because compassion is, that doesn't go away. That doesn't, you know, you might not care about how you eat one day or how you look or, you know, but compassion, that's a, that's a mainstay of our being, of our core, of our, of our existence. And so I think connecting with the compassionate part is so important. And, um, and I think everyone's, we're, we're headed there eventually. We're all Amen. headed there eventually, but, it, but it's, it is a, um, I, get, I mean, the atrocities that happen are so numerous. Um, you can spend the entire you know, you could spend days talking about it, but I think the other thing to work to, and you mentioned like, you know, it feels like you're crazy sometimes because the majority of the people are okay with this. Majority of people you run into are okay with the, 
subjugation and murder of, of innocent animals because we don't look at them a certain way. Just like I'm sure it must have been crazy for certain people earlier in like America's history when slavery was rampant. The majority of people were okay with it. It wasn't you were weird if you were like I'm an abolitionist. Oh yeah, right? well same like, with you're same a, with, like you know yeah. <laughs> so, same with Nazi Germany. Jews are cockroaches. Jews are rats. And honestly, it was, it was when normal. I to be against that was like weird. Like it was weird. Not? I mean, you had to hide. I I just watched the most touching, amazing video about this man who saved 696 young children in the Holocaust. He, he and no one found out about it till 50 years later because he just thought it was the right thing to do. He found out that children were being murdered by the the thou hundreds of thousands and, and did something about it. I can't think of his name right now. Oh, so inspiring. But no, my vegans I've seen bring light, just like these people who stood up to the Nazi idealism, the Nazi ideals, which is not idealism. <laughs> um, <laughs> the vegans shine light on something that is innately wrong. Murdering other animals for our taste buds is innately wrong. Okay, and and I honestly I find that attitude when people are just don't even care. It's just like Hitler's because he wrote about how he hated the Jews for bringing morality to the consciousness. He actually wrote that in Mein Kampf. He actually wrote about that in his writings, that the, the main reason he just hated Jews is because of the Ten Commandments and their book, because of the Torah, bringing consciousness to humanity. And it messed up his whole hedonistic lifestyle and didn't flow with his game of, I can do whatever I want whenever I want. So... Yeah, we're going to experience a, a lot of pushback. I mean, PETA is like the number one most hated group on earth, and I know why. They're in your face for sure. But even more than groups of humans who murder other humans, more than, than like oh, like great. snuff film websites, they PETA is like has more hatred and more... I, I mean, it's just like our priorities I, pretty, are... are I've noticed that too, and I, it always boggles my mind when there's this like... Peter hate. It was like, if you're going to be a vegan, at least shut up about it. <laughs> it's like, like no, we're talking out about it because for for health, for the planet, for the animals, for our souls. Well, I have a question. I mean, hey, we're humans. When that old saying, when you put a baby in a crib with an apple and a rabbit, the baby's going to pet the bunny and eat the apple. Okay? We're, we No human baby has ever wanted to eat the bunny. No human... We eat the apple. We're herbivores. We're not even omnivores. We're trying to be omnivores, but look where it's gotten us. We're sick and depressed and warring and raping and subjugating racist, sexist. Martin Luther King Jr. talked all about it. He talked about racism is directly linked to speciesism. Speciesism. Like, it's all part and parcel, babe. Everything is everything. And, and, you know, I love, I love the quote by Einstein, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And that's how I feel that you are living your life, Temi Tope. That's how my mom sees you on the yoga mat. And you're, you're truly living that way. And yeah, like how, well, I, I have a few last questions for you. First of all, how, did you notice a change in your physical, mental, spiritual self after you went vegan? Uh, one, although my veganism took time, it was over time, um, 100%. There's no doubt whatsoever. I mean, it changed. I mean, it's kind of, you know, even the small weird things, right? Like, um, like I wouldn't kill bugs in my house anymore. Right? I'd try to capture them and release them outside. And I'd feel good about it. Yeah. Weird, you know, not like in a, hopefully not in like a self-righteous way, but like, Oh, that's that life that whatever they were doing, whatever they were on their way doing in that whatever lifespan they hold, like, keep doing it. I didn't make you. I didn't make these insects. I didn't make this plant. Like, that was made by whatever made me. And if I can, I'm not going to not gonna try to stop that or mess it up. It's like, just like you don't see flowers. Most people don't see flowers and want to stomp on them. You know, you're like, like, oh, do your thing. And so it changed, like, even something like that, what I never thought about before, right? If I saw a spider or, an ant or something, like, I had no problem killing it back in the day. I didn't think about it. I wasn't mindful. I wasn't aware. I didn't. I literally did not consider their life. I didn't consider. I, my ego was was constraining me. But if I can see another being and think about their life, and that's the th same thing. And I think it allows us to kill other beings, or let it be okay to kill other beings, right? Even something as small as like killing an insect. You know, no, that 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 grows, right? If you have an indifference to the life of another being, um, and so that change. Um, even how I treated other people, 
my um, I feel like I was more calm with other people. I was I wasn't taking in stress as much, right? I'm not taking in the stressful life of other beings or the um, and so like you know I'm less prone to get in arguments. Yeah, I found myself uh, less prone to react to other things, right? Um, I don't know. It just made, made me like I felt. I felt more calm. I felt more peaceful. It just felt, felt good, you know? And then also just even in my body digestively, like it feels good to like, I felt lighter, literally felt lighter, like food digested and went through my body faster. And so it was just more on my toes and, you know, doing yoga as well helped with that, you know, it just kind of went hand in hand and um, it just felt really good. And, and even like, I think a lot of yogis, people who practice yoga, even if they aren't vegan, a lot of times they end up eating less meat or less hair. They're very mindful of, Sure, if I want to practice yoga, I got to be able to twist and turn and, and bend. And if I'm eating things that stay in my system, it's not going to work. That's right. You know, That's it's right. Not, it just doesn't feel good. So you're even more mindful about when you eat and how you eat. And eventually that mindfulness will creep into what you're eating or quote unquote who you're eating. Yes. You know, yes. Not even quotes, like who you're eating. These are other beings when you're, when you're not, uh, um, when you're eating the flesh of another being. And I know some people get, you know, I, I offended but they shouldn't i feel like people shouldn't get offended it is it, that's is what it is i'm, I'm not, not gonna judge eat your dog damage. no they're who's i'm not but, why would yeah, you call your dog a who and your cat a who and not a pig or a cow or a chicken or a lamb or a goat right well that's 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 that cultural racist supremacy right because it's like my cultures and norms when i you know it happened with michael vick right when when michael vick was was was, was caught uh, doing this to dogs it was like oh my gosh yeah. Oh, he's the what? He shouldn't be. He same thing should be done to him. And then you'll go to In and Out and have a have a burger where the cow was treated worse than the, the, the dogs. Yep. And yep. That, that that that's cultural supremacy, right? Because you're saying because I and my forefathers or foremothers thought these animals were worth something, then they are. But if you think an animal's worth something, forget you. Like how dare you? It's like no, you're just that's very. That's crazy. It's That's crazy. crazy. And, I, and I saw that happening. It was wild. Um, and people do it all the time. People yeah. do it all the time. It's related. To, it, there's so many things in it. There's, there's so many. Um, there's so many. So much of what happens in a society, right? You can look at it from almost any angle. You're like, oh, there's environmental issues. There's health issues. Yeah. Or you know, racial issues, right? Societal justice. And vegan veganism. You know, this idea of being vegan, the vegan philosophy, if you will, for lack of a better word, touches on all those things. It's all connected. It's not just, it's 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 so much more than just a diet. It's like connected to it. And so when people want to be like, oh, I don't want to talk about veganism, let's talk about this other justice thing. It's like it, the threads, you're pulling it over there. You can't you know, talk I mean, about you, you the can't. other without talking about the other. Yeah, no, it's all connected. And right. it's not a stretch to bring in veganism. It's like, no, that's that's why. So, you know. Yeah. And I won't go into too much of this is probably a whole nother another um, topic thing, but you know, when people came out with, you know, when there was the uh, which is still it's been happening forever, but the Black Lives Matter movement. And then people would be like, All lives matter and it's like and you're not vegan, it's like, mm, that's right. super super like you right. you're literally saying that as a reaction, A, to these people, you know, this, this the, the suffering of these people and you don't actually really mean it. That's right. You don't actually even really mean it. So that's it's like right. it's doubly horrible, but when we don't have, um, when we don't have mindfulness, I think, and we don't have that meditation, that peace, peacefulness within ourselves, and we don't cultivate that, that bullshit will happen again and again, over and over. Um, we even, even in how we, we talk about um, um, the simple stuff with language, right? Like we talked about growing up, it'd be like, oh, I love chicken, or I love fish, or I love. No, I never, I never liked fish. Yeah, <laughs> good. Um, <laughs> we use the word love to talk about what we like to eat. Like, you don't love that chicken. In fact, you don't care about that chicken. You love the taste of that chicken's flesh. And you literally mean the exact opposite of what you're saying. Wow. But but if you're if you're willing to then use the word love for that, how do we then treat our spouses and other people we say we love? And you could be hurting them. And it's like, ah, this shit's, it's all linked up. It's linked up to the most simple stuff. But it's like, you literally said you love steak. But you don't give a fuck about a steak. You don't care. You literally don't care if they cut its throat and serve its body on your... So then what does that mean when you say, I love my mom, I love my kids, I love whatever, right, America, whatever you want to put. It's like, do we even know what love means? And how can you use the same word to mean something totally opposite? Uh, we have to really check out and examine. But that doesn't, I was part of that, right? So I'm saying this from like, I'm being self-critical. And it's like, oh, I didn't really even notice what I was saying and what I was doing. 
until I slowed down and just let my mind settle and, and meditated on it and just think about it. Just think about what's going on. And so, again, I, I, the, I feel like the most, the best way is to point people to themselves, which is what yoga does. Just sit down and look, examine yourself, examine what you're doing and how your movements in the world are affecting other people. And don't judge yourself necessarily. I mean, like, don't be like mad if it's not going to be not perfect. Of course it's not perfect. That's why we're here on this earth. That's why we're playing this cosmic drama game of life. Like, it's the, and it's crazy right now. There's all these things going on. And it's, it is just a cosmic drama. This is a big play from a yogic perspective. This is this is a God dream that we're in. And we're yes. playing roles. And these are characters. And, like, if you went vegan at this time where there weren't a lot of vegans, well, you're that's this is your role. And your role is to be the person that makes these videos and puts these things out and to be in the minority and like your role is to be, you know, to be the, and, and, and to be a hero in that role, you know, and, and to, and to love in that role, no matter what side of it you're on, you know? And so here's where we are. Yeah. Right now it's crazy. It's almost like you're in a video game and like people around you are freaking, we're, they eat zombies. We're zombies. We eat dead things. Totally. That's normal. Oh my God. So you as a character in this role where like everyone around you is, imagine you're in a zombie movie, like in a Twilight Zone film where everyone around you thinks it's okay to eat humans. Wow. Or That's other beings, right? Which is really what it is. I'm like, oh wow, wow. And so instead of like just be freaking out and not playing the game, be like, all right, so this is the game right now. This is the game I'm in. This is my role. There's, everyone around me is eating other beings. Um, I realize that it's crazy. Most people don't. Some people do. All right, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And it's not an easy problem. But that's the thing we're in. That's what we're supposed to go through. So it's like, all right, oh, okay, wow. You know, you get the initial like, oh, shit. But no, 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 that's not going to work. Just like any game you play, it's like, you can't just hop up. You have to do this and then do that and do this. <laughs> and then you can hop up the thing. And that's what we're in. And so we have to our creative ways to keep loving, stay compassionate, and not turn into to, to, to hateful people, right? And not turn into, like, condemning and judgeful people. and But yes. also just to, to, to solve the thing. And I think in that journey of understanding how to do that we become better people become evolved souls and um and compassion flowers throughout our entire lives and i think that's awesome and i'm willing to to to, i mean i'm here that's why i'm here i'm willing to take up that that thing it's like okay i'm okay i'm I'm okay to be on this team and to be surrounded by the zombie eaters and i love some of my family i love them you know they're all in my family really right every human being even the ones that you know but same that's that's the game down to play you are so on point and such an inspiration. You just completely blew my mind. I'm going to, Temi Tope, thank you. You have just laid it down. You've just laid it all out. I am so grateful for you. Yes. Likewise. Thank you it, for, uh, for hosting I'm the platform. I'm so early. grateful to be on your team in this blossoming emergence of more consciousness. Yes, my loves, if, if we claim to be environmentalists, humanitarians, feminists, activists, animal lovers, health enthusiasts, you must be vegan. You must because eventually. you're, you're going to get there eventually, like it or not. I if hope you, you get there up, because claiming to be any one of those things and not realizing that what's on the end of your fork, every bite of flesh and sip of milk and bite of omelet egg that we consume is buying into the horrors that make us not environmentalists, not humanitarians, and not lovers of all beings and the phrase did not say do unto other humans do unto other white humans do unto (laughs) other black humans it didn't say that it said do unto others as you you would have others do unto you others no no special cases all others all others if you and okay i'm gonna bring this up before i ask you for your inspirations because you're so much of mine but the other thing and i know you've studied so many spiritual walks of life in the Bible, Torah, and every other book in the Vedas, it talks about it. Not only ahimsa and doing unto others, but it talks specifically about not mixing DNA. Not mixing animal, or any other DNA, like scientifically, like basically not playing God. Like it says in so many words, I am your God, I've created you perfect, don't mix your DNA. What are we doing with every vaccine, every pharmaceutical drug, every bite of flesh? That's becoming our DNA. We're becoming these tortured beings and cows, chickens. We're becoming zombies. We're becoming things that are not human. 
And that's why we're seeing so much murder and so much violence and so much confusion and so much depression and so many behavioral disorders and so many families broken up. We're ripping cows and, and pigs and, and chicks away from their parents. Guess what? Divorce is astronomical and families are, are being broken up left and right. So my loves, please look into going vegan. <laughs> Listen to the wisdom of Temi Tope. He has come to it through such a beautiful path. I'm so grateful that you have so we can have this conversation. Who are, who are your inspirations and can you recommend some books to read and websites to scope out so we can get to the garden? <laughs> right, beautiful. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not super familiar with the, um, with the, um, with the DNA mixing thing exactly. I know like, because, you know, obviously we mix DNA to make other children, you know, the DNA, you know, the chromosomes, et cetera, or even with plants, there's DNA, First et cetera. Hand. First um, hand. Yeah, firsthand. So, right. so I'm not, yeah, I'm not, yeah, exactly. So I'm not, I'm not super positive. I'm not super aware of of uh, of, of that. Um, however, um, I do think we have to be mindful of, of how we are, you know, attempting to re re recreate all these things and do these things in, in certain ways, especially when the, when there's no com compassion in it, right? Like there's times where, you know, doctors performing procedures and doing medicine, which is like splicing DNA with other DNA, it might be helpful to like graft a heart to another person's body that needs a kidney a, a transplant right but that's out of compassion and to help save someone i think compassion is is such an easy guiding factor in it all right it's like whatever you're doing like is compassion there because if it's gone i don't care what it is it's probably not a good look there's probably mm -hmm. something wrong with it but if something as simple as compassion which babies to adults to the almost elderly to, most, <laughs> to the youngest can get then just keep that with you in your pocket and that's easy you don't have to learn too much you don't have to like read up on every single x y or z it's like but is compassion there are we doing this with compassion because if not and something else is driving it then that's it's an easy indicator you know um and, and to that point i would say that that um some of the beings are things that inspired me to that so many i'm probably missing a few in speaking on it but um definitely have to point out paramatsu yogananda's um autobiography of a yogi and even though technically he wasn't a vegan in, as far as vegan ideals this is back in you know, he's coming from a very ancient Indian uh, tradition, um, and I believe he came in the 1800s. In 1920, he came to the United States. Was born in the 1800s, came in 1920, but um, but was vegetarian. It was so it was still in the same mindset, and right, it wasn't that wasn't a time where we had this, um, especially where he came from in India. The, the production of milk and eggs wasn't done in the same kind of greedy way. Right. Um, right. I'm not saying that like everyone should eat milk and eggs either, but I'm just saying reading his works is the idea of compassion and seeing compassion, seeing the divine in every other being, including animals was something that he espoused and, and spoke about in a way that transcended even our human bodies. It's like, about a, it's a very deep, beautiful spiritual book. Mm -hmm. Autobiography of a Yogi, highly recommended. Um, Ricky Williams, huge inspiration for me being a football player growing up in school. And he became like a Yogi and like, a vegan, <laughs> um, and used to play football. It was amazing at football. But he's been a yeah. huge inspiration for me. Um, Gary Orofsky, someone I, I love. No, I don't agree with everything he says. I think, you know, right. he, 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 he can be very biting and, and, and very harsh for some people. But I think, again, that's his role. That's his character to play for his, for what he's experienced in his life. He is playing the role he needs to play and being the temperate he needs to be at this point. Doesn't mean I'm like that, you know, but a lot of the stuff that he's done, I have to be grateful for because, you know, reading, the, watching The Greatest Speech Ever, probably going to watch that a good 50, 60 times, you know, and it's just one of the most powerful and beautiful things. And the work he's done that's helped, helped, uh, kind of spread that awareness in other places, um, is fantastic. I don't, and I don't think the point is to replicate ourselves. I don't want a vegan that's just like me necessarily. No, like, but I just, if God you can inspire to be on the, the path, for me, for me, <laughs> the path for me. Work, <laughs> <laughs> um, that was huge. Um, uh, there's so many others, Dr. Gregor, did amazing work. So yes. many vegans. I, I literally can't. Doctor Will Tuttle. Yes. Um, my goodness. The, world the I think diet. The Black Hebrews. The Black Hebrews have these these uh, kind of Hebrew um, vegan uh, places all around. Um, even um, what's the name? The the Elijah Muhammad uh, from the Nation of Islam, yes. who wrote the book How to eat, How to Eat How to Live eat, Eating to Live How to Eat to Live. KRS One, who actually talked about that book in his in his um, in his rap uh, Beef, in his song yes. called Beef. He talks about Elijah Muhammad's book where this was back back in the day where he was telling like African Americans like um, like yo we've learned how to eat 
you know, from being in America for so long, we've been eating crazy. Like, and you talked about eating, not eating meat. And like, you know, it was such, it's such, such an advanced being for that time where no one was talking about that. Not to mention like this weird, like nation of Islam, what in America, like it's such, such, such a beautiful thing. Um, but there's there's a, there's a ton of folk Yeshua himself uh, and the work, the work that was done. Uh, a few books that I had written down. I want to uh, talk about the dreaded comparison written yeah. by Marjorie Spiegel. Yes. It looks at it directly confronts what people don't want. That's why it's called the dreaded comparison. It compares American slavery, um, past and present, and, uh, of African Americans and that of animals. It's like you got to look at it. Slavery. Is something, we don't even like talking about slavery in this country. It's right. like not a topic people like to bring up. But yeah. you're gonna bring up of that and animal suffering and tie it together people aren't ready but it's out there so check out that book um the souls of animals written by gary kowalski it just looks at animals it just looks at animals and the things they do that aren't these like scientific drives of like it does this because of that. it's like yeah. looks how they how they love playing how they love enjoying things mm-hmm. how they their beings how they're related to us how like the whooping crane just flies up in the air and then falls down into the air and just and whoops and has fun and it's just Dancing through the air just because, frolicking. You know, it looks at animals in that way of how they just love being and they have these souls. And it's, it's. I believe it's titled tongue in cheek as a reference to W. B. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folk, which yeah. was written, I believe, in the same vein to like show people that like, you know, black people or people of African descent are yes. human beings. They have souls. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, the souls of, you know, like painting the picture of their their humanity or their beingness, right? Not even humanity. I think that sometimes that's a uh, a. Uh, a species uh, supremacist word we use as though humans have, as though like be humane like hold on <laughs> wait no don't don't be humane be more like the animals because they're more right, compassionate no. and more joyful yeah be more right. like an animal yeah <laughs> eternal treblinka which you talked about a uh, great book um the sexual politics of meat which i mentioned earlier and a little tyke which is a story a short story about a vegetarian lioness um who was not singular there's many stories of um so-called carnivores, living vegetarian lifestyles. Um, a lot of times in India, when sometimes uh, saints or gurus would adopt tigers or lions, and those lions and tigers would become calm and peaceful like their guru um, and and would end up not eating meat um, um, and things like that. And so, and it's not, again, I'm not saying it happens all the time. I'm not saying I'm on a crusade to turn all, you know, lions into, uh, into um, herbivores necessarily. No. But I'm just saying, like, it can happen. And um, uh, and people often not ask, sometimes, uh, not to mention all the vegan bodybuilders, you know. Uh, and people would say, like, you know, what if I go vegan? Well, I lose my muscle. What is this or that? Like, and then, like, you, people oftentimes, you know, look at look at an ox. Look at a horse. Look at the muscle definition and development on these beings. Yep. All they eat is grass. Look at a bull. Have you seen how strong a bull's shoulders yeah. are? Yeah. All they eat is grass when they're allowed to be wild and free and eat what they really right. eat. And the, exercise. The, yeah, the cows that are fed not, corn yeah, and other not cows. Strong. Right. Right. Not right. a muscle, necessarily a muscle. And it's not the only form of protein. So it's like, that is not, we've been messed with in our heads and things like, oh, animals, they eat meat are the strongest. Like, no, it's not even kind of true. Not even a little bit true, not actually. Even. No, that's right. They're not the strongest at all. They might have the most sharp teeth. But like, that's, you know, and I, and I, totally side theory and I might totally be wrong on this I don't know but I think like over time as we evolve and things become more compassionate and more vegan perhaps if you will I do think that carnivores will probably like become extinct I just think I don't know for some reason I think like it just over time like it's very hard for carnivores animals that eat other animals it's hard it's very difficult they have to find they feel like hunt them down every day they live some of the hardest lives I don't think it's going to be sustainable uh, in, in a certain time, I do believe there's a time where a place in human history where like there aren't carnivores and that's, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it has to happen. It's just, I don't know something about it. Just that's very outlandish, you know, very arguable, you know, there's nothing scientific behind it. I just don't, I don't know. I think well, it's a, the lion shall lay down with the lamb. It's been prophesized. That, that, uh, exactly. So the it's lion, not even the lamb, about the carnivores of the world being going extinct. It's about the carnivores going vegan. <laughs> no for real incredible. i mean it's been written about in every book it literally like and my dog's vegan she's the most loving kind beautiful angel yes she does go out in the backyard and eat squirrels and birds if they're dead but 
she is vegan and happy and thriving and healthy and she does not have the itchy paw thing that my other dog friends have that eat meat products. She doesn't have allergies. She doesn't have tumors, cancer. She doesn't have everything that I see in, in domesticated pets who eat meat. So whatever they're going to lack from their vegan herbivorean diets, it's not half as bad as the terrible health they're going to gain from eating meat products. So whatever she's lacking, I'll give her a supplement for, or I'll she can go out in the backyard and, and forage, and she does find dead animals. So, but right. yes, honey, you know, and, and, in, and in nature, I'm sure it's I know it's not necessarily always the same. I don't I don't argue that to people that like you know in, in you know tigers or or any kind of meat eating animals, which which are, there's a lot far less than 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 um, herbivores, right? That's the majority right. of meat eating animals. I think the I think uh, it's like twenty five percent. It's not a lot. Yeah, most animals don't eat other animals. That's right. It's actually a hard thing to do. That's right. Um, but like, yeah, I, I think ultimately them going, be, you know, the line laying down with the lamb, you know, uh, the metaphor or not, I think then at that point they're not vegan. They're not uh, carnivores anymore, right? They're just right, and then eventually they evolve probably away these things that they grow over time to deal with it. I think, you know, how much of a part did humans play in, in making animals turn towards or, or each other and animals to t turn towards is like we have to, we have to eat other animals or it's like desperate times right we take all their habitat we we don't treat them well right it's like they, they're struggling you know but in a time where if we took care of animals well we're really stewards and really perform dominion over animals in a kind way and they didn't have to would they really want to chase down a gazelle and like right. almost starve because they can't have enough stuff for their or would they be like oh, I'm not gonna I'm I'm going to chill. I'm going to eat what's right here. It's not running away from me. Plants twigs and right berries. Away. Twigs and berries, baby. Get back to the garden. Get back to the garden. Get Stop back to the garden. Stop with these false beliefs. Please, my loves, educate yourselves. Please read the books. I'm actually going to put them in the description at the bottom of this video. Temi Fantastic. Tope's number one top tier, top shelf Rex to <laughs> be a more compassionate, less of a carbon footprint v being, vegan being on this earth. I admire you so much, Temi Tope. I am so, so grateful to the universe for sending you my way. I Likewise. just, thank I cannot you so thank you enough for sharing your wisdom and your deep, heartfelt feelings about loving the earth and the beings that we share this earth with and each other. Your girlfriend is a lucky, lucky lady. Your family is so lucky to have you and our community is so lucky to have you. I am so grateful. I can't wait to take your yoga class and hear... Your profound Any, wisdom. I, I will be there, babe. <laughs> Thank you so much. You, oh, you'll know. I'll be wearing this shirt. <laughs> I'll be wearing less than that. <laughs> no, but I so appreciate you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to put your website down below. But do you want to tell our viewers how we can find you and learn more profound things about life? <laughs> sure. Anytime. Uh, any. Uh, thank you, first off, for the, also the platform, and thanks to your mother. And uh, I really appreciate you guys. Um, but yeah, TamiTopeYoga.com. T E M I T O P E Y O G A dot com. Timmy Tope Yoga. Timmy Tope is my first name. Um, just kind of long. Um, but yeah, and I try to put stuff up on there. I have links to my Facebook and Instagram under the same uh, same handle, Timmy Tope Yoga. Um, and yeah, it's a lot of yoga. You know, recommendations on books and other things. Ooh, which I need to mention another one. Yes. Helen Keller's Light in My Darkness. Wow. Helen Keller, Light in My Darkness. Wow. Amazing book, amazing book, a fantastic, amazing book. Um, Thank you. Ah, so much awareness. She was deep uh, because remember you when know, I talked about the importance of meditation and awareness, and um, sometimes it's hard to get into that. You have to have a practice. But Helen Keller, her life circumstances forced her into meditation. Her eyes were closed. Her ears were closed. She couldn't hear. She couldn't see. And she wrote an autobiography called Light in My Darkness. She was in the meditation and she saw the light, you know, and she was very aware of that third eye and the stuff that so many religions talk about in so many different ways. She was a spiritual giant and um, it'll give you goosebumps up your spinal column when you read about, when you read from her. You know, a lot of times we've read about her, people talking about her, just like we do with a lot of the greats that start religions, people talk about Yeshua, right? People talk about but when you hear the words from her herself to you, then you'll truly, truly are blessed because it's a miracle. It's a miracle that we even get to hear her words because she couldn't, she couldn't hear and she couldn't see. 
she was brilliant and um she's been one of the most her and emmanuel swedenborg which was her um kind of her guru in a way um then this was mystic christianity back in early america when things were crazy but you see so even in the craziest times right with you the, the slavery or the cannibals or the zombie eating there's always a threat of people even in like the Kali Dark Ages, right? So, you know, Yeshua was here. Right? When people were crucifying people, you still had these people. Yes. Even if it was smaller and not, not in the majority of the people who were carrying the torch of light and awareness and beauty. And you can see it in a lot of these things in the books I recommended, I hope. Um, so, yeah, my pleasure. And thanks for having me on. Oh, Temi Tope, thank you. I am so excited to read half of those books because I've only <laughs> read half of them. And I absolutely agree. They are incredible. Everybody, lots of love, lots of consciousness. Please live a compassionate, upstanding, virtuous existence. Go vegan, get educated, get inspired, and go to temitopeyoga.com as your first stop on that path. Thank you so Thank much, you. my inspired kindred spirit. You are a blessing and a light unto the nations. I am so honored to be in your glory. Thank you. You're incredible. We got to do this again soon. <laughs> See you soon, babes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Angel.